Hey, so welcome and thanks for coming out tonight. Um, got a really uh, great event. Uh, I'd like to thank the staff who have worked really hard to make this possible. And um, thanks to Victoria Jackson, uh, Sean Klein, and Terry Schumacher, who are the co-directors of the uh, sports at the Humanities Institute. This is our newest initiative and already it has, we knew it would have a lot um, to say and a lot to do, be incredibly relevant. And we thought, well, there's a lot of sports stuff going on in the university, uh, whether it's uh, the journalism school or whether it's in medicine, uh, but the value, the, the value of sports is in the humanities, in, in the values of uh, the players, and all those are, who are involved with sport. So why, we, why we're engaged with sport is because of the human endeavor. We thought that uh, having uh, the humanities represented at the Humanities uh, Institute, uh, sports represented at the Humanities Institute was really important. So uh, we're very pleased to have this event tonight, which is the inaugural Sports at the Humanities Institute Community Service Award. And I'll just uh, keep this short and turn it over to Victoria Jackson. Victoria. Thank you so much, Ron. Can you hear me okay? Is this microphone good? Okay. Um, so as Ron said, I'm Victoria Jackson. Many of you know me. I recognize many students. Um, before I do anything else, I want to recognize the other Victoria in the room, Victoria Day, who I, I am so impressed by her organizational skills and pulling this all together. So thank you so much, Victoria and Ron and the whole Humanities Institute staff. It is so refreshing to be around people who are just so happy and helpful and just on it. So thank you. <laughs> um, and Terry Shoemaker is here, fellow director of the sports at Humanities Institute and Curtis also with the Humanities Institute, just an awesome group. Um, and thank you, Bruce. <laughs> we do um, cool sports humanities things here, and um, we have a wonderful Dean of Humanities, Jeffrey Cohen, who is hugely supportive of our work, um, and, and we're really grateful for that. So I want to thank Dean um, Jeffrey Cohen also. I so I should give you a rundown of what we're doing. I'm going to introduce um, what we're doing here and also, you know, our honorary recipient of the, the inaugural Community Service Award. And then we're gonna have a conversation about um, the, the state and future of college sports. I first learned about Ramogi Huma and his work in the early 2010s, more than 10 years ago, when news started to trickle out of the University of North Carolina about widespread academic fraud in athletics. And when Taylor Branch published The Shame of College Sports in the Atlantic, and the renowned civil rights historian and author wrote that college sports contained the unmistakable whiff of the plantation. When Ed O'Bannon and team filed their antitrust lawsuit, when football players started writing hashtag APU on their wristbands, all players united. Um, when Kane Coulter and Northwestern University football players sought to institute an athlete bill of rights, including the right to organize, when UConn basketball player, and UConn's back in the Final Four again, when UConn basketball player Shabazz Napier at a Final Four press conference admitted that there were hard times and nights where he went to bed hungry, when I would make snacks, flip on the TV, and watch really meaty Senate committee hearings discussing systemic issues and harms in college sports. My very first public talk 10 years ago, when I was still a PhD candidate, I was talking about you and your work. <laughs> I mean, it's just really remarkable, your longevity, and you're, you're the glue here connecting all of these issues. Um, you are the person across all these various efforts to make this institution of college sports live up to its promises and potential. I think this piece is what folks admire the most about your work and your approach. You see a world in which institutions of higher education can embrace the opportunity to make changes in ways so that everybody wins. And there's optimism and a collaborative spirit in what you do. 
And your goal in your North Star is working to make this very complex, complicated system, American college sports, truly and optimally serve the young people who come through it. Um, and I, I think that is why I value and appreciate your approach so much is like the clarity and the collaborative will to work with people to make this better. That, that is really cool. Um, so I'm gonna read a brief bio and then we'll dive in soon um, to get into more detail about the work that you do. Uh, Ramogi Huma became an advocate for college athletes' rights while playing football for UCLA. There he earned a bachelor's degree in sociology and a master's degree in public health, both of which inform his advocacy work. His Bruins teams won back-to-back -back conference championships in 97 and 98. And something I always do with students is remind like, we shine light on the athletic excellence also when we're talking about activist athletes and that it's even more impressive that they're able to take care of the work and do the job while they're also engaged in stuff off the field. Ramogi Huma is founder and director of the National College Players Association, a 501c3 nonprofit advocacy group that holds a mission to serve and educate athletes and to provide the means for college athletes to voice their concerns and influence NCAA policies. He has worked with thousands of college athletes on over 150 campuses to participate in actions in pursuit of pr improving their lives. Uma has held hundreds of meetings with lawmakers and testified in support of college athletes' rights in the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives. So those hearings I was tuning into a decade ago, I was watching and admiring the way Ramogi conducted himself <laughs> while speaking about these issues. Um, and, and not just at the U.S. Um, House and Senate, but also in state legislatures and city councils. Huma has served as a primary voice and has assisted in developing laws in support of college athlete name, image, and likeness legislation. Maybe you've heard of NIL or name, image, and likeness recently. Um, and in over a dozen states, starting with California and as well as the United States Congress, he has also provided expertise and witnesses to the U.S. Department of Justice regarding NCAA antitrust violations on multiple occasions and served as a consultant in athletes' rights antitrust lawsuits. And there are many, <laughs> White versus NCAA, Agnew versus NCAA, O'Bannon, Alston, Jenkins. His work has convinced state legislatures and federal courts that athletes' economic justice is a racial justice issue. His work has created the conditions for a massive general public shift in perspectives on college sports. For these efforts, earlier this year, Time Magazine featured Ramogi Huma as one of 18 Black leaders who are closers, working to end the racial wealth gap. And likewise, for these efforts, the Humanities Institute at Arizona State University is honored and thrilled to be re awarding Ramogi Huma its inaugural sports at HI Community Service Award. And I couldn't help myself. Um, I had teased you that I was gonna get a big trophy and then was like, oh no, I'm not going to, but I did. Um, because you've done so much. So I, it, this is like a Champions League trophy where like, you know, the team comes together and everybody hoists it up at the end. So I did get you a big trophy. If you don't mind coming up. And, you know, we, we don't have to, like, put it out, but here you go. Oh, wow. Thank, thank, thank you, you so, so much. Thank you so much. This is, this is amazing. You didn't have to be here. It's, I think it's Victoria's. now the biggest trophy I have ever. Thank you. Thank you. Put it over here. That's good. You put it on the podium. Sure. No, I'm, I'm teasing. You can keep it down. <laughs> it's big. She, she wants to put my big. back out. <laughs> no, Victoria, uh, first, I just want to say thank you so much. Um, and the Humanities Institute for really keeping track of these issues. This is something that when I played, it was very difficult to get out in the open and have a debate on and much less make progress. So I really appreciate uh, the focus on this effort and looking forward to diving in and hopefully have some questions. Uh, don't be shy. I'm, I'm sure there's lots of questions that'll be out there. Yeah, I won't be monopolizing the time here. So we wanna hear from you too. And folks on Zoom, um, there's a Q&A function in Zoom and you can enter your, I'm like looking as if I can see you all. Um, you can enter your questions in the Q&A and we can address those too as well. Um, but I get to start. And I wanted to start by really grounding this and taking us back 
to a pre moment in which everybody knows what NIL is and understands the economic rights of athletes and the labor issues involved to an earlier period. And this kind of mentality and approach and understanding of college sports is very much alive and well. So it's not to say that it has gone away, but there's um, an idea in the United States that that um, there's this aura around being a college athlete and an understanding that this is a means, this is a vehicle through which people who might not go to college get to go to college and get to achieve the American dream, that it's a, an opportunity for underserved communities to gain access to you know, the nation's most elite and exclusive universities. And of course, I have to mention at this point that ASU prides itself on our inclusive mission, and we are not one of those schools that takes pride in its low acceptance rate and that sort of thing. And then there's also this kind of accompanying myth that college sports, athletes in college sports are living large, right? They're getting a world-class education. They're getting a world-class opportunity to play sports. Everything's paid for. They got all these people working for them. They're jet setting around the country. Like they're living the dream. They're big man on campus. Like everybody wants to be a college athlete and aren't they lucky? And maybe as a, an ancillary kind of additional point to that, and if they're asking for more or complaining about their situation, you know, they're not great, they're ungrateful, they're greedy, like how dare they? I have all this college debt, you don't have any college debt. And so I think we should start by kind of situating this dream. Like this is very much real. I mean, co college sports are where a lot of diversity exists on college campuses. And it is an incredible opportunity. I mean, I talk with students all the time about how I had an idyllic college athlete experience. I got to go pro in sport in school and it, you know, this served me well. So let's start with your opportunities in sport and how you approached going to college and playing for UCLA. Sure. Um, and you're bringing me back. You're bringing <laughs> me back. So, you know, as a high school football player, we had a, a great team. We were like number one in the nation my senior year until the last game. It was painful. But, um, you know, we had a lot of talent uh, and there was a lot of scholarship offers. So, you know, throughout that time, you did feel like, hey, this is this is pretty exciting. This is big. Um, prior to that, I didn't know how I'd be able to pay for college exactly. You know, we were kind of a lower middle class family, but college costs a lot. You know, so for me, I felt too. This is my ticket. Um, I had good grades, you know, but not UCLA good grades. You know, for the incoming freshman class, I had maybe a 3.8, but the incoming freshman averaged like a 4.2, 4.3. You know, so how do you get into a school like this without sports? But you know what's interesting is that uh, for a lot of recruits, um, you're told like, hey, this opportunity is kind of like winning the lottery. You get to kind of coast in there. You know, you don't have to worry about all the stuff that we have to do to get ourselves to college if we get there. And, and there's a lot. Look, there's a trade-off. I'm not saying it's not um, significant to take out student loans when you're a regular student and to work part-time and everything else. And that's how regular students put their themselves through school. And athletes is different. You put in a ton of time. And, and there's a lot of effort, and that's how you put your way, yourself through school. But I remember uh, meeting with the academic counselor in high school, and she was like, well, we can just kind of catch up because you have a, you have a full ride. You know, um, you're going to UCLA, and you know, there's no need to really talk about anything. So we just kind of hung out. But the reality is that it would have been, it, it's good for athletes to know, okay, because if, if that fell through, what if I got injured? Mm -hmm. And if UCLA didn't honor my scholarship, I would have had zero knowledge. You know, so at the high school level, even uh, subconsciously, athletes are conditioned, hey, it's a lottery ticket. But if you've ever heard of anybody winning the lottery and still had to put in 40, 50 hours a week to get that money, that's not the lottery and that's not charity. Um, they called it, they used to call it a lot in the press and say talking point, this is a free ride. It's a free ride. You're going to college for free and you're riding. But in reality, you're pushing that bus. You're pushing the ride. You're the, you're the labor, right? And it's not free. It's a lot of time commitment. And you sign up for it. But the way it's characterized is so misleading. Um, but it, it was an exciting time. I was grateful, still am, to have had the opportunity and the interest from the various schools. Um, but you know, I, I, just, I just have to say to anybody here or on, online, um, this in and around recruits, I think it's, it's not a good message to characterize sports as a way out. And to pretend like, hey, look, you're from a lower socioeconomic 
area, so this is how we do it. Because if you spent a fraction of the time in academics and enrichment, you can get to college without sports. You have, you know, if you're, the amount of time you put in your sport as a high school athlete and, and even a youth athlete before high school, if you spend a fraction of that time working on academics, you'll get to college and you won't have to grind like that in that, that particular way. Now everybody sees big time football and basketball, but that's rare when you're talking about thousands of schools. The average athlete, you're not even in a big time industry. You really aren't. So a lot doesn't calibrate for the amount of people just trying to get into division one sports. Many of them don't, most won't. You just kind of look at the opportunity costs and that's a loss in academic opportunity. It's kind of counterintuitive when the whole system's set up by the schools. Mm -hmm. Um, I, so Ramogi has been in many documentary films looking at big time college sports and there's a story you share where, um, a moment in which the kind of rose tinted glasses started to lose that tint and maybe you even took them all the way off. What, what happened while you were at UCLA that opened your eyes to maybe there, there's something more systemically, um, problematic going on here. So during my first year, there was actually two things, one at the beginning, one towards the end of my first year. Uh, at the beginning, um, so I was a true freshman. I didn't redshirt. I was backing up an All-American linebacker um, who was on a radio show talking about how tough it was to get by on the scholarship. Didn't know why, but he didn't have any food in his refrigerator, and he still had a few days till his scholarship check came. Um, an agent heard, heard him on the radio, left groceries, uh, groceries on his doorstep. His roommate took in the groceries. He had no idea. Anyway, the NSA found out, you know, hard to place blame. I don't know who else would have known, but somehow word got to the NCA that groceries were left on his doorstep. And when the NCA found out, they suspended him because they said, well, you only got those groceries because you were on a radio show that's related to your athletic prominence. Basically, it's an NIL violation. And, you know, they suspended him. The NCA suspended him. I had just passed the student store, went to the locker room, sat in a team meeting to hear this. And I, I was reflecting back in. When I passed by the student store, they were selling his jersey, number 23, in the student store, fully capitalizing off of his NIL, his name, image, and likeness. And they would, have had a, they would have rather seen him broke and hungry, you know, without food. Now, we were 12th in the, I think we number 12th in the nation at the time, 5-0 and 0 at the time, and he was a big reason why. Mm -hmm. And that was just hip hypocritical and unjust. And then going into summer workouts, uh, so-called voluntary workouts, even today, they're voluntary. Um, if you voluntarily want to sit the bench, sure, they're voluntary. <laughs> um, but, you know, most people want to get better in the summertime. It's a great time to develop yourself. Mm -hmm. But UCLA told us, look, if you show up to these workouts and get injured, uh, the NCAA has a rule where, where we cannot pay for any of your medical expenses because these are classified as voluntary workouts. And to me, that, that, was, that was kind of it. It was just like, this is crazy. This is crazy. How come no one has fixed this? How come no one's talking about this? And, you know, as I mentioned, I had some, um, you know, a, a very good high school football team. And, you know, between talking to the, some of the guys in my class at UCLA and some of the guys that I knew at other schools, we basically all felt the same way. And the thought was, well, let's get together and let's, let's push. Um, so that's two, two things happened my first year that really, I don't know when the glasses fell off exactly, but they were, <laughs> they were pretty much gone by, by the end of the year. And you started an organization as a student that later became the NCPA, right? Like that yeah. was the moment that you started working on this. Yeah, so my, I had an older brother who was playing football at Idaho, and he was involved in student government, and I talked to him about it too. And he's like, you know, start a student group. If you're going to do it, start a student group. At least you can reserve some rooms, you know, have a little bit of standing and kind of formalize a little, a little bit, um, which I looked to do, and we did. Um, which again, it sounds more impressive than it was. It was three people in a mission statement. You file it, that's it. You have a student group. But it did kind <laughs> of create a structure of, hey, we have something now. Let's try to build something. We didn't know exactly what we were doing, where we were going, but that's how it started. And uh, that was 27 years ago now. That was 1997. So I, I think um, there's kind of a foundation that was laid before um, folks like Ramogi and athletes could start addressing kind of the industry, the business approach, um, economic rights, labor rights. And that kind of foundational work had to do a lot with the kind of root cause of all of this, which is the power imbalance 
and the problematic power dynamics in big time college sports. Um, it is unbelievable the kind of chipping away and a restoration and a bringing up of power with athletes that has taken place thanks to and as a result of the work by Romogi Huma's NCPA and, we're, and, and shining light on athletes who are bringing these issues to the attention of organizations to kind of amplify those voices. Um, and, you know, the overarching kind of myth that worked to justify all of this is this idea of amateurism. And in a collegiate space, it's like this merging of the paternalism of higher education with um, kind of the morality and purity of Olympic amateurism, that there's a right way to play sport, a sports for sports sake approach that the Olympics have long abandoned. But the, the kind of paternalism of higher ed, that we know what's best for you, all of this is in service of you. And meanwhile, the business continued to grow. Um, that is how we end up in situations where all power lies with coaches and hardly any power lies with athletes. And those coaches are facing really challenging situations in which like their job is dependent on their ability to win. Um, no matter what the rhetoric is around developing athletes holistically or focusing on their educational and academic goals. So, um, you know, yes, we will talk about NIL and revenue sharing and collective bargaining, but before we get to that, can you explain this, I mean, like list off the scope of all of the protections and benefits that have expanded since the, the late 90s that athlete, athletes have been receiving? Sure, sure, and I think, you know, one of the big transition points was corralling players who were like-minded into just kind of speaking out in our own way at the time and then beyond. Because it took so much before you got to any of this change, um, it took so much to break through the propaganda, like 100-year-old propaganda, everything you were talking about, amateurism, student athlete, we got to take care of these athletes. Just to give you guys an idea of what that meant, the NCAA has a, a principle of uh, amateurism it says something to the effect that the NCAA is, has a principle to protect college athletes from the forces of commercialization. And what that meant was Nike's going to pay us for that logo on your body, and you, and you can't get a dime for that logo on your body. That's what it meant, right? But they literally say this stuff out loud. Um, so before any of that progress can be made, it was like you have to break through and have a counter argument. You know, no one... Didn't, it seemed like we looked around and no one was standing up for the athletes, and, and so we kind of did it ourselves. But um, there's a long way to go. We still have a whole laundry list of goals, but there have been some uh, breakthroughs. I think earlier you mentioned uh, collaborating with the United States Department of Justice Antitrust Division, who we went to. I mean, really at the core of this, when you're talking about the power dynamic, instinctively we kept outside the system. You know, when we first announced ourselves and started, UCLA was like, oh, you know, why don't you come in here? We have our Student Athlete Advisory Committee which they control and they set the agenda for. And they didn't even know about these issues. They had no idea that UCLA or these other schools would point to these SAC committees as a solution because they were planning dances and they were um, encouraging each other to come out, turn out for each other's games. Had no idea that they could be stuck with medical bills during the summertime, had no idea about anything, you know? And so instinctively it was like kind of getting close to the flame and ooh, that doesn't feel good, so let's stay outside. Mm -hmm. It's with outside, outside the system is where progress has been made. So the US DOJ, um, we had gone um, to request that they got in, get involved because basically anytime the NCAA restrains schools from providing anything of value, compensation, medical care during summer workouts, um, at the time there was only a one-year scholarship, they capped it, you can provide more than a one-year scholarship. Those are all illegal mechanisms. They're antitrust violations. So we went to the antitrust police and... <laughs> And, and the compensation, we really went there with, for the compensation, among other things. And they said, oh, that's, that's pretty dicey. You're probably right. But, you know, they kind of listened, and that was it. But a couple of years later, they asked us to help them in an investigation on uh, the scholarship limit. Mm -hmm. So at the time, one-year scholarships were the, you know, some of you might remember, wait, wasn't there a time when they were four years? That was back. That changed in the 70s. The coaches were like, nope, we don't like this. We, we want to be able to get rid of players when we feel like it. But the myth still came, because when I, I got offered in the 90s, they still called it a four-year scholarship. They lied. Everybody was lying. 
Everybody it was a one year. They wouldn't even allow to offer a four year scholarship. And that was business as usual. So the DOJ investigated. And when the DOJ investigates, they take it pretty seriously. Um, and it wasn't long after that. It might have been the same year that suddenly the NCAA had to change their heart and allow schools to offer multi year scholarships. So now today, especially a lot of Div Division I schools like Arizona State, there are multi year scholarships, usually four year scholarships, maybe five years if you redshirt. So that was important. You know, one of our goals is to, been, uh, is to uh, increase graduation rates and, and really hold schools accountable. We're saying, look, if you're gonna recruit me to your school, then you have to provide the means for me to actually have a realistic chance to graduate. And, and that, a one year scholarship that a coach can yank away at the end of the year, that's not cutting it. So um, that was uh, you know, one of the big ones. Another one, you mentioned the O'Bannon suit. The O'Bannon, Ed O'Bannon, UCLA, um, former Hall of Famer, he uh, sued the NCAA over its restraint, again, an antitrust violation. They didn't allow athletes to receive NIL money, third party endorsements, right? And so he sued over that. Um, and this was, it was frustrating because, you know, the case was great. The lawyers fought hard. Ed stood up. We had, for the first time, current athletes joined the suit. You could watch them play on Saturdays. And they're in the lawsuit against the NCAA. It was pretty cool. And the judge basically said, you're right. This is completely illegal. But we're going to allow them to keep doing that. That was literally part of the remedy, which was really frustrating. And the Ninth Circuit upheld that. And they were wrong. The Supreme Court proved it later. But what they did do is that they, they increased the NCAA's limit on athletic scholarships so the cost of attendance, if you're a student here, you know what that is. It's the price tag of the school. Say so ASU says, look, this is how much it costs to come here. A quote unquote full athletic scholarship as defined by the NCAA was short of that by about three to $5,000 per player per year everywhere in the nation. Once again, very deceptive. I thought I was on a full scholarship to cover all expenses, but it was designed to fall short. No wonder my teammate was on a radio station talking about where's the food? Where are the, the basic necessities? No wonder they have credit card companies out there right outside the athletic department where you can sign up and get a free bottle because you, you know, you're a magnet. You need some money, they're going to offer it, and you got you to survive, right? So thankfully, in that remedy, the, the, the court said you can no longer cap scholarships below the cost of attendance. So now schools have the option to provide uh, scholarships that, that truly cover the cost of attendance. Um, and that was a big deal. That's, you know, uh, millions and tens of millions of dollars of transfer every year to athletes across the nation. Um, and, and then you mentioned NIL, that was another big one. I think, um, well, let me go back because <laughs> there, there's a little bit of confusion on the NIL and there's a, another big lawsuit, the Austin case, all right? So in 2014, <clears throat> I helped arrange um, the part of the Austin case that was the injunctive relief part that made it to the US Supreme Court that basically sought to stop the NSA from comp uh, restricting compensation to college athletes. Well, along the way, it got narrowed to only educational related compensation, which was about $6,000 per player per year. It was a win, um, marginal win on the money, a big win on the, on the precedent, big win. Because when we sponsored our first NIL bill in California, you know, um, the NCAA, and then we started getting bills uh, passed across the nation, the NCAA was posturing, well, we're, Maybe those states, maybe, but nobody else. You know, we're, we're going to restrain this. We're going to, and they were talking about some draconian restrictions. And you're just like, read the room. You know, this is it's not going your way. And, and I said at the beginning, as soon as California's passed, I said, either you're going to adopt California's precedent as NSA rule, or you're going you're gonna to become irrelevant. And they chose to become irrelevant, and they truly were. But right up until when the NCA was, was going to announce its terrible restrictions that they were going to impose on the other um, states that didn't have NIL laws. A couple of days before the Supreme Court, 9-0 said, you don't have an antitrust exemption and you lose, 9-0. You know, this is divided Supreme Court, 9-0. You know, so that precedent, two days later, they didn't say they halted their announcement. A couple of days later, they said, forget it. They said, do what you want. And the only thing that we're gonna try to restrain is you can't use NIL as an inducement and a school can't pay a player directly. Everything else, uh, you know, that's it, you know, so those things, and that took seven years, the Austin case took seven years. Um, and in the meantime, so much injustice, but at least we got to a point where players now have that freedom. And I think with that freedom, um, it's, it's just snowballing opportunities for players. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the power dynamic is shifting. When I talked about, you have to do this outside the NCAA, you have to do this outside the colleges. We're talking about state lawmakers passing NIL laws. We're talking about the US Department of Justice policing 
antitrust laws, and we're talking about the, the lawyers and the players getting together in the judicial system to bring change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you th for walking through that. And I think circling back to um, pointing out the problematic nature of the one-year renewable scholarship was a stepstone to current athletes having some of that power and voice restored so that they could take on kind of next level steps. Because a one-year renewable contract looks an awful like, lot like an employment contract, right? Especially if it can be canceled due to anything as simple as personality differences with the coach. Um, because the coach can say, well, you're not abiding by team rules and the coach can make up whatever those team rules are. So restoring four and five year guaranteed scholarships and some schools now those are lifetime scholarships as long as you're in good academic standing you know what that means is if you go pro if you leave in good academic standing you can come back at any time and finish your degree and the, the school will honor that that scholarship or if you get injured if you have a career ending injury and need to go on a medical release um, the, the school is obligated to cover that and you know prior to um, athletes, you know, literally giving the NCPA a call and saying, I need your help with this. You know, if you got hurt, you could have your scholarship revoked. And there was like no re legal recourse as a result of that. You couldn't have representation, um, you, you know, all of this stuff. So um, that is kind of the foundation where then you could take on the bigger antitrust challenges. And the playbook here was to call it pay for play. I mean, the, the schools in the NCAA were calling increased spending on education pay for play. And it was spending on education. Um, the right of athletes to make money from third parties, just like all other students on campus do, that's NIL. Um, and, you know, I, I like to call NIL restoring to students who play sports the economic rights of all students. Because do we have any engineering, computer engineering majors in the room? Cool. We have, we have a number. So if you like designed just the coolest technology and app and sold it to a company, or if you're just like kicking butt and you interview with like a local company like Intel and they, you know, they want you, um, you know, first of all, if you sold that app, it would be like front page news on ASU news, right? Because, and then you, they would be celebrating the fact that you sold it for X amount of dollars you know, you're an amateur while you're still working toward that major, but you can make money as an amateur and it's not like tainting your eligibility to continue to study computer engineering. Um, and so it was a restriction placed only on athletes. And again, it has to do with, you know, well, that's pay for play and competitive balance and all of these rules in place that really kind of allow schools to claim that they're serving students, but really developing things that have an, a possibility of causing harm. I wanna ask you a couple silly questions. <laughs> um, and then we'll, we'll talk about the broader business changes and where we're going, where we see this all headache. Um, so, you know, we've alluded to the California Fair Pay to Play Act. Um, it, you know, that was Ramogi Huma and some other folks too. So my first question related to that, were you, did you get to hang out at the shop with LeBron James <laughs> and Governor Gavin Newsom and Newsom signed that bill into law. I, I, Were you at the on the shop? No, I, I wasn't. I wasn't. That was a nice surprise I woke up to. Um, <laughs> I didn't see it live or anything. I saw that. I saw the replays. And um, I just thought, because there was a big question of whether or not G uh, Gavin Newsom was going to sign it. Mm. And, um, you know, LeBron being a part of that, I think that's a great, and just the way it happened, signing on the show, that's that's Cali for you, right? That's like Showtime, that's the Lakers Showtime, LeBron, and and um, I was just so relieved because I can't tell you, we've had plenty of bills fail. I mean, in months and months and years and years of failed, bill, failed bills that had promise and it wasn't a guarantee. So I was just, I was just joyful. I was just joyful. And then next thing, you know, it was like, well, how do we get this everywhere else? You know, that was just the transition because um, in terms of antitrust again, uh, Mark Emmer, the NCAA president at the time, where it was started to be started to make threats against California. And that was the most difficult part of getting a state to do something. Basically implying if you pass that law, we're kicking you out of NCAA sports. You know, maybe you're not in the tournament anymore and things like that. That's also an antitrust violation. That's a threat of a group boycott. It's illegal. Um, 
so after that bill was signed, I was invited to go speak actually at the antitrust uh, division at the US DOJ. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, just talk about things. And you know, I kind of used it as an opportunity. I said, well, I'm not gonna waste this. So I talked about the antitrust implications from A to Z. And then I called on the US DOJ to investigate the NCAA for threats of group boycott against California for that very issue. And the, uh, the chief at the time uh, had conversations and publicly said, you know, in the Wall Street Journal, hey, we have concerns about this group boycott threat. When the NCAA was denying it was a threat, they immediately stopped making that threat. And that was key to us going to these other states because states like New Jersey, that were smaller. They're like, yeah, California did it, but how can we do it? What if we get kicked out? Mm -hmm. So that was another kind of um, piece of the puzzle that was really important because for years, you know, California wouldn't go there. And I guess from, by the time 2019 happened or came along, um, California had been in it with some of these other big companies threatening boycotts and things like that in California. Kind of California lawmakers learned eventually, well, they're still going to do business here, you know, and there's legal reasons why they, they can't do certain things. And thankfully, they were more hardened than they were when we first started out, and, and that's how it got started. On that team, Andy Schwartz and Mark Edelman and um, Representative Nancy Skinner and you, I have a follow-up is that do you all have like Power Ranger rings? Because it was remarkable what you were able to accomplish. I mean, this was the first state law that provoked all the other states to get their state NIL laws, which put all this pressure on the NCAA once the Austin opinion was unanimous that, okay, we better just remove this restriction on athletes making money from third parties. Do you have Power Ranger rings? We don't have the rings. We don't have the rings. We have a, there's a picture that's pretty cool. <laughs> But really, it just came together like Andy Swartz. He's, I credit him with informing me and the NCAA so much about the economics of how this could all, things like this can work and not destroy college sports. You know, that was a big fear I didn't know about until Andy broke it down economically and then started to have the confidence. Okay, we can, we can take a scalpel and do some things here. And Nancy Skinner, she had been listening to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar forever. You know, he's been, <laughs> he's been on talking about this forever. So yeah. It just all kind of coalesced and um, it became a, a powerful force. But I'll talk to them about rings and I'll let them know. Okay. That, that'd be pretty cool. You should <laughs> get, you each get a color. <laughs> and then do you and court, Senator Cory Booker have have your like something in the sort of a power injury? Because you've really worked together on this stuff for a long time. Senator Booker is amazing. And he likes to joke that we've both been working on this since we since we had hair. <laughs> but he's just been, um, you know, in Congress, just so you know, there's been a lot of attacks against college athletes, right? There's been bill after bill after bill designed to strip all the stuff we're talking about, so much of it away, and give it right back to the schools on the platter. And Senator Booker has been a pillar. He's just not, not having it. You know, um, uh, Senator Blumenthal, Senator Cantwell has been very supportive. This you know, there's been a lot of people in Congress that are fully aware, fully understand, and not only are trying to prevent bad things ha from happening, but trying to, you know, really get the rest of reform, what, what this should look like, um, implemented as federal law. But, and, and Senator Booker, if you didn't know, played football at Stanford. So he lived this, you know, he lived this in a way. So it's like kind of just jumping back in the locker room when you have conversations, you know, it's, it's pretty cool that someone can just get it. You don't really have to walk them through much. You know. Yeah. Um, so Senator Cory Booker played football at Stanford. Stanford will be in the Atlantic Coast Conference next year on the East Coast. Ramogi Huma played football at UCLA, which will be in the Big Ten Conference next year. I competed and we are all at Arizona State University and ASU will be in the Big 12 next year. So these three Pac-12 schools. <laughs> and I bring this up because while folks like Ramogi Huma have been hard at work to build out protections for athletes, safety protections, um, we didn't even mention like the fact that we don't have a protocol for heat exhaustion after Jordan McNair died during an off-season workout at the University of Maryland. Like this is the stuff that people like Ramogi Huma are working on a broad athlete bill of rights. Um, there's a reason why when Northwestern uh, University football players were organizing, they were talking about a bill of rights, you know, this platform of things like guaranteed scholarships, medical coverage, 
um, safety protections, a, like not just the full scholarship, the guaranteed scholarship, but a real education that's protected, not being channeled into fake classes or having to change majors, those sorts of protections. And, and that is really a testament to the work that you've been doing both in media to talk about broader athletes' rights and also, you know, working with athletes to make them see how they deserve a better deal in this thing that's been promised, right? This idyllic, the trade-off here being the idyllic academic and athletic experience if it's not a professional sport. Um, and so while you were hard at work at that, um, you know, the, the schools through their conferences and um, broadcasters and, um, you know, the leaders of college sports have really worked to aggressively grow this business. Um, we've seen conference realignment or consolidation. Um, you know, the death of the Big East Conference, it's, it's been resuscitated, right? It's back, but it is not a football conference anymore. That was the conference picked off apart the last time all of the major conferences were renegotiating their TV deals. Now we sit and we're just reflecting on the demise of the Pac-12 conference. The money is growing as a result of that. And the college football playoff, both its launch a decade ago and now its expansion means more money. So while protesting and calling pay for play all of the things that are an expansion of rights and benefits, they've been ruthlessly growing the business and fighting it and then claiming responsibility for introducing those benefits. If you tune in to watch the men's and women's final fours, over the next few days, you will see commercials talking about all the additional benefits that athletes now enjoy. That's not because of the student, the schools, that's because of athletes bringing attention to those issues, thanks to them connecting with Romo Gihuma. <laughs> so let's talk about what you see conference consolidation as being um, and and the college football playoff expansion and these media rights um, negotiations, all of that. What do you see in all of that? What are the schools telling you when they make those business moves? Well, the schools don't talk to me about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, their actions. But I think that actions. it is just just stark hypocrisy, right? The read the all the justifications for denying athletes economic rights, economic freedom fair compensation, fair treatment, is because, hey, this is about amateurism. This isn't big business. This is something special. It's all about education. Meanwhile, they're raiding each other ruthlessly, right? Um, and on the athlete, what that means to the athletes, for one, it makes our argument stronger. I mean, like all these different things, you, they may be getting more money, but it just makes our argument so much stronger. You know, any forum we go to, we're talking about that, you know, antitrust, legislature, in the media, um, it helps us in many ways, but it hurts the players in many ways, depending on which school you're at. Mm -hmm. you know, a school like Arizona State, geographically, is not the worst thing in the world, you know, to be in the Big 12 versus the Pac-12. Pac but Stanford and Cal, going to the ACC, and just if you don't know, the ACC is like the edge of the eastern United States, just schools littered on that edge. And then you got Stanford and Cal on this edge. Oh, and right? SMU too. Oh, Yeah. <laughs> right. I forget about SMU. But, so right. <laughs> you have, and they're doing this for football money primarily and basketball money. Um, and it's already just, you know, it puts a lot more on the players. You know, I, I'm, I'm born and raised in Southern California. A commute can drive you nuts. I mean, literally, you, you waste your life on those freeways if you're commuting back and forth. But these athletes tack on all this airtime, tack it on. And, and if you know, some of these athletes are going to be, be flying commercial, you know, and there's always delays, especially, I don't know, it seems like planes are delayed and flight cancellations all the time. Meanwhile, you're supposed to somehow get an education. Again, these are the institutions saying, come here and graduate with a degree here, and they pump it up and they sell you something. Meanwhile, what could you, what could you major in, you know, when you're, when you're an athlete? You know, already, can you do field work, really, during the season? There's a lot of things that are just already foreclosed, and now it puts even more opportunities out of reach and, and then you get celebrated on these NSA commercials and it's supposed to be all about education. It's not all about education. And, and on top of that, they're not even bothered to think clearly, you know, bothering to think clearly about some of these things because 
they're chasing football and basketball revenue, but yet they're forcing all the non-revenue athletes, Olympic athletes, to fly across the nation too as camouflage to pretend that it's not big business. That's all it is. As an afterthought, well, we just did it with these athletes, so let's just do it with all. And that's detrimental to them. They have no business dragging all those athletes across the nation. No business whatsoever. Um, and it's frustrating. And the other thing, you know, and I hopefully we'll get into a little bit because this is always like the boogeyman of pay, paying players what they're worth. But, you know, they say, well, if we lose, we have to pay, start paying players money. You know, the other athletes, we may have to start cutting sports, you know, and, and, and that's just greedy of those football and basketball players. And, hey, what about everybody else, right? First of all, in all this movement, did anybody care at all about Oregon State or Washington State? And what, what's going to happen to their revenues and whether or not gonna, they're going to be able to maintain the sports being the only two schools left in the Pac-12 with nobody else? You can't. It's two. It's the Pac-2 right now. You know, it, the money just left. Nobody cared. It was cutthroat, right? Secondly, just to answer the question because I already took, put it out there. Um, you don't need big football and basketball revenues to fund all these other sports. Okay, that's been the mantra, that's been the myth, and I can prove it, because if you've ever heard of NCAA Division II, it, it, there's a Division II, you guys have heard it, it exists, they have scholarships, they have coaches, they have a lot of athletes, 100,000 athletes, about 300 schools, and they don't have big football and basketball money. They don't. And neither does Division III, NAIA is another division, community colleges, high school, school-based sports, you know, it's this myth that Vision wants to say, hey, the only way we can have all this is if we have, you know, billions of dollars in revenue and, and, and all this other stuff's going on. And right there sitting, you know, the same organization as Division II proving otherwise. And the money, even at these levels, the money to fund all, the other, all these other sports has been paid for long ago. Those thresholds have been passed long ago. You know, you talk about the college football playoff, all this new money coming in. That's money on top. Sports is recession proof, is COVID proof, it's everything proof, money keeps going up, set your watch to it, it's gonna go up. And they're always gonna pretend, well, yeah, we need every penny to continue funding all these non-revenue sports. It's a lie, it's an absolute lie. And we can prove it with the numbers, you look at the what they report to the government, um, they're required to report their revenues um, to, the, to the government. So they say, well, you know, our revenues equal our expenses. It's miraculous how every budget zeroes out. I mean, I mean, to the, <laughs> If, if the last, there's tens of millions of dollars, and if the last two digits are seven six in revenue, it'll be seven six in expenses. It'll be down. Wow, every dollar is accounted for for 99% of, of these schools. But you're paying your coach $3 million if you're, if you're low budget, right. or you're paying your coach $8 million or $10 million. And you're saying that's necessary to have a program? So, for example, I looked it up before I got here. So, Arizona State, Division One, uh, total revenues most recently reported. $107 million. Northern Arizona, Division I. Okay, maybe not FBS football, but they still have football. Division I, you still have football team and scholarships. They generate about $23 million. Mm -hmm. How do they exist? <laughs> they shouldn't even exist, right? They should, they should be a myth. They should not exist, but they do. That's evidence. And yeah, maybe Arizona State has maybe 200 more athletes. Okay, maybe one and a half, maybe one and a half times the athletes that Northern Arizona has. Arizona State has, you know, more than four times the revenue. So it's not about preserving athletes and what it means to the athletes. They can do it much less um, than what they're, what they're spending. So, mm -hmm. you know, for this, you know, the conference realignment, the cutthroat activity that's going on, it just further exemplifies what this truly is. So when they go to court and they go in front of the National Labor Relations Board and they try to pretend this is just about amateurism, we got evidence. We got evidence. No, it's not. This is cutthroat. This is business and treat these athletes fairly. Yeah, and I mean, we've been in conversations where we've pointed out, you know, there's an effort to place a cap. Well, there is a cap on what athletes make, right? Because there is compensation, which is happening, which is grant made and cost of attendance and the stipends from the Alston decision now and all of that, like that is compensation. It's just not fair compensation um, and not reflective of the market value of the athletes and the sports that are bringing in, especially the media rights monies. And so, um, you know, we have both been in rooms where there are um, senators and representatives introducing bills on the Senate side and the House side, 
um, you know, trying to get athletes not classified as employees. So it'll be like, we'll create this entity to be a clearinghouse for NAL deals. And by the way, we're also going to say that athletes can never be employees. And, and that would be something where they're getting an antitrust protection or exemption, right? Uh, uh, limited liability protection or whatever they're calling it instead of an antitrust exemption. Well, they're not asking if they can place a cap on coaches' salaries. They're not asking if they can place a cap on the monies that schools spend or the distances that teams travel. And so that really tells us what this is all about. Um, and it, it's that competitive arms race because there isn't a cap placed on spending in those other categories that means that it's just a bad business model. And that's why I think both of us have assu had assumed over the past 20 years that smart people in higher ed who pride themselves on being innovative and you know leading the world in new directions would recognize that this is a bad business model and do something to fix that bad business model and redesign all of this. And that's why I've always appreciated your work is that I think you believe like, oh, well, if we just show them this, they'll know they need to fix it. And that's been the hard part is that that hasn't happened. <laughs> so we're still in rooms with senators and representatives trying to block bills that slide in the athletes can't be employees stuff. Um, yeah, so we're in the year 2024. If you had a crystal ball and could predict what's coming next, what do you think is coming next in college sports? You know, I would say this, under current laws, the athletes win. You know, there's uh, multiple efforts to have athletes recognized as employees. Ours is one of them. We filed a unfair labor practice charge against uh, USC, the Pac-12 and the NCAA as joint employers of USC football, men and women's basketball players. Um, to affirm their employee status in one day, allow them the option to, if they want to, form a union and try to collectively bargain. Um, under current under current antitrust laws, the Supreme Court spoke unanimously on on what we talked about nine zero. You know the writing's on the wall there. Um, so those issues are are you know really in the players' favor. Legislatures, you know, like California, we have another bill um, that would require colleges to a revenue share, which we expect would domino across the nation just like an IL did. So under the current laws. <clears throat> You have antitrust where players should win. You have um, employee status where players should win. And you have state lawmakers who now, because of NIL, the first go around with NIL, understand a lot more of the issues. And they definitely understand the need to com compete and keep up with other states. But what you're talking about, the part that makes the crystal ball kind of foggy, mm -hmm. is that there's so many efforts in Congress to change those very laws, to carve players' rights equal rights away from players under antitrust law, labor law, to handcuff the states so, so, the states so that they can never get involved in protecting the players and, and, and guaranteeing economic rights. So they want to basically treat college athletes specifically as second-class citizens, literally, literally. Every one of you have, has these rights. Every single one of you, unless you're an athlete in here. But they want to carve these players out. And that's what we're fighting against. So, I mean, one of our top priorities is to play defense in Congress. You know, when I'm talking about Cory Booker standing up, that's what I'm talking about, what he's standing up against. That's the X factor. Um, and we, you know, it will, it will continue to fight it out. But I think Congress right now, not likely for things to happen this year, it's an election year, who knows what, whatever things happen uh, next year. But I think in the meantime, if we get some wins, um, it'll start to submit. Like before NIL, the NCAA wanted to, they had proposals to take everything away before the app, before NIL became effective. Some of the laws had passed, but it hadn't become effective yet. The NCAA tried to race there and take it all away before it happened. Once it happened, and you got money in players' pockets on NIL. In those very states, those lawmakers didn't, you know, they weren't really receiving that request the same way. Like you're telling me I got to take money out of the starting quarterback's pocket out of Florida State or Alabama or that's just not really going to be feasible anymore. That moment has passed. So um, hopefully we'll get some wins before there's any real uh, momentum in Congress to take it all away, to prevent it, to prevent re mainly revenue share um, in employee status. The reason employee status, you know, you, you have to have a means to break open these, these avenues, right? And, um, and potentially empower players, you know, to, you know, if they want to choose to collectively bargain. But I will say this too. 
really important for players to be discerning right now. If you jump into a union right now, if you're a Division I football player, you're still up against NCAA caps. And if your school, even if you thought you had the power to pressure your school into thinking about doing it, your school's gonna say, they'll kick us out of NCAA sports, we'll be punished, we won't be able to play. So no, There's, that's how powerful those illegal compensation limits are. And, and the big reason, one big reason that those antitrust lawsuits are, are, are needed because those lawsuits have the ability to remove those caps. And then if players decide that, hey, we might be able to get more by joining a union and collectively bargaining, then they do so without having to face these illegal compensation limits. So I think that's really important. And really, the antitrust lawsuits and even employee status can still take years. You know, it can still be, this, this could still be another three, four years in either of those forums. The Austin case and O'Bannon case took seven years each. So that's the part that is frustrating. When I start talking about years and numbers, you see my face kind of twist a little bit because, <laughs> you know, we feel like we're in a sprint and it's hard to watch these athletes just cycle through an unjust system. But, you know, we're trying, we're trying our best. Well, thank you. All right, well, we have time for Q&A now. So if there's questions in the audience, we have some handheld microphones that are gonna make their way around the room. And then also folks on Zoom, you can, if you haven't already, please enter questions into the Q&A function in Zoom. Thanks. All right, sweet. So um, are you familiar with Grant House's lawsuit with the NCAA? Yes, I'm aware of that lawsuit, yes. Okay. Um, do you have any hand in that, or what's your opinion on that? Um, so I'm not directly advising that case. We're very supportive of that case. Um, so this lawsuit is a lawsuit against the NCAA and the Power Five conferences um, because they had rules in place that prohibited athletes, or still prohibit athletes from receiving any of the media rights revenue, the TV money, and for all of their past sins. You know, now they're allowing NIL, which, you know, prior to that, uh, that freedom, they've been breaking the law. So it's, it's an also a uh, opportunity to get some justice for the players who have been harmed during that. We're supportive. That's a major case. It already has class certification. The class has been certified. <clears throat> I think the trial date's in January. And that is probably the number one um, most immediate and powerful pressure on NCAA sports when you talk about all the different lawsuits going on right now. How how um how big is it that it was given the class um action certification from a district judge? That's important. And in the very first lawsuit, the White versus NCA lawsuit that I was an advisor on in 2005, that was the first time that uh, football and, and basketball players in Division One were certified as a class. That's a major component. You know, the NCA would try to say, no, they're all the same. They or you know, it's just too hard to say that they're a class. There's all these other athletes too. So that particular lawsuit was the foundation for O'Bannon filing his suit, Austin and now um, the, the house case. Sweet, thank you. <laughs> so you're, you're a UCLA guy, um, so you obviously hate USC is my guess, right? So how do you feel about Reggie Bush and do you think he deserves his Heisman back? Give that man his Heisman back. Look, I'm a Bruin, and I hate USC on the field. Um, love the players, okay? Because you know this is about this is higher than more important than that. And in that vein, in that spirit, give him his Heisman back. The NCAA was wrong in the first place. Literally, he got punished. He, that was a symptom of an illegal activity. The illegal activity that truly happened was these antitrust violations. The NCAA saying no, you and your family can't get anything of value because of your NIL. And look at today. You know, um, you know, it's been validated, and the NCAA is having a now they celebrate NIL, right? Every 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 school now, oh look, our athletes they have juggernauts. We have support for NIL. You know, what's the difference? You know, and I just think it's a shame. You know, they that NIL benefit back then, it didn't superpower his running. It didn't make him any. He, it wasn't steroids, right? I mean, give that man his Heisman back. He deserves it. Period. There were people in prison for violations of NIL rules because they, you know, it's like, it's like how you get folks in the mafia, how you get them in prison, which is like, 
it's under the table money. So you're breaking laws about reporting income and those sorts of things. So the Adidas or the FBI probe into the Adidas money that was running under the table to basketball players. Um, there were there was an Adidas exec and a former assistant coach who were in prison the day the NCAA lifted the restriction on athletes for making money from third parties. So literally the things that they had been forced to go underground to do were now allowed to be above ground. And they were still in prison. And Jamal Murphy wrote a really good interview with one of those people. So check out Jamal's piece on that. <laughs> I'll just say, I mean, gosh, I'm glad we're past those days, but the FBI enforced, basically was enforcing illegal NCAA rules is what was going on. I mean, our hope was, hey, investigate the NCAA for the antitrust violations. That's, again, that's a symptom. Whatever's going on under the table is a symptom. The real problem is that, you know, these schools are colluding, conferences are colluding with the NCAA to prevent these types of exchanges from happening in the first place. You know, so that was, there's been times where it's been, I, I get why the schools, the conferences, and the, and the NCAA want to do this. Mainly because it, it gives them more money. That's that's it, right? Um, but to see some of the parts of the federal government, you know, start to enforce these things or become complicit in certain ways, like you mentioned, the unionization effort back in 2014. Um, the only ruling on the book so far, um, well, now there's you have Dartmouth now, but at the time, you know, the regional the region agreed. Yes, North, Northwestern football players are employees, and Northwestern appealed it to the full board. And the full board refused to make a decision. They say, we just don't want to touch it. And imagine that a court, what if a judge in a regular court just says, ah, we just don't want to get involved. You know, it's like, well, it's either yes or no, right? We deserve our day in court. But I felt at that point, the federal government was, at that part, the NLRB was complicit in, in looking the other way. I felt, I felt like the Department of Justice went back to them in, I think it was maybe 2009, 2010, and asked them to get involved on this antitrust violation on compensation, they refused. There's been times where it's been very discouraging. You're not just up against the schools, you're up against you know, people who have heard one side of the story for so long. And when I say 100 years of propaganda, it, there's consequences to that. You know? So the players who have stood up over time, the brave souls who have, who have stood up, you know, just even in the media, uh, in front of lawmakers, and, and stepping up to be a part of these class action lawsuits, They've changed everything. And you know, finally we're at a point where people are actually listening, you know, listening to the numbers, listening to the facts. And um, like I said, there's, I, there's a lot of momentum. I feel like the wind's at our back in a sense, but Congress can take it all the way. And that's, that's a scary prospect. Hello, my name's Andrew. Oh, hi. Here we go. <laughs> um, so, I wanted to ask earlier um, in your discussion, you were talking about you, there's some lawsuit that you filed against USC, the Pac-12 and the NCAA. And it got me thinking like this upcoming year, the Pac-12 has pretty much ceased to exist. And the college sports landscape is one that's constantly changing. Players graduating, conference realignments, programs dissolving during COVID, you know, we saw. How does this environment being so different from pretty much any other business, any other economy, how does it affect what you do in your business or your organization? That's an interesting one, because that might have some effects. I mean, and I, I can't get too much into that in terms of the Pac-12. You know, as is the Pac-12, they still exist, but USC is leaving the Pac-12. So there's some questions there. Um, but this, regardless of whether or not they, they leave and what the board rules on them in particular, I think it's going to set a precedent one way or another. You know, our hope is that I don't expect the judge to dismiss the Pac-12. And as long as the judge makes a ruling that includes the Pac-12, it'll set a precedent that can be applicable, you know, other places. But um, USC is a private school. And the NLRB, they only have jurisdiction over private entities. The conferences are private. The NCAA is private. It's different than ASU. ASU is a public school. So the NLRB doesn't have any direct jurisdiction over ASU, for instance. So um, if we win in the USC case, then there'll be implications for about a third of Division I schools that are private. And regardless of how it all shifts around, conferences realigning and all, they're, they're private. And um, the one kind of more, I guess you could say, novel argument in this particular case is that 
obviously we're talking about three employers, that, that's called joint employer, um, which isn't a typical, it's not really a typical argument, it's, it's more difficult to, uh, to prove. But um, if we can prove joint employer uh, arrangements exist for USC football and basketball players, then basically there'll be precedent for all the other uh, private schools and conferences and the NCAA, um, if it exists, I saw some today, there was a question of whether or not the, this proposal is being floated about the, the power conferences leaving the NCAA and we don't know how it's gonna go, but one way or another, there's, there's gonna be some private entity that's gonna be you know, governing in some, in some way which will likely have employment um, implications. Over here. Hi. Oh. Ken. Um, with the NCAA being almost 120 years old, obviously it's a ton of power and under a ton of scrutiny all the time. I, I have a three-part question for you. Do, do you think they can fix this? Number two, do, you, do they want to fix it? And number three, back to what we just talked about over here, is there another organization that you think will take over the NCAA in the future? Those are good and tough questions. Um, I'm not the NCAA, so I can't, you know, I can assess. You know, the NCAA, I think, wants to fix it, but their fix is different than our fix. So I think so far they're still kind of digging in as an organization. The NCAA, um, there's competing interests. You have within the NCAA, Really, the, the entities that pass NCAA rules are the schools themselves. And you have schools like ASU and the power conferences. You have schools like uh, Northern Arizona who aren't, right? And they have different ways they want to fix. Um, the NCAA president, he can kind of vocalize ideas, but he has no power to actually address anything. Um, he actually proposed unlimited revenue sharing, in a sense, um, in December. I thought that took courage. I really, it did. Um, so I think that's an indication of really the desperation. Um, and it's a newer NCAA president, so maybe a change in focus. But at this particular time, when proposing any caps at all, it's an antitrust violation. The only proposal you can really legally make and try to push forward is one that doesn't have any kind of caps. Um, but I think it's an indication that he's at least, you know, trying to start the conversation and, and, and all that. But are they structurally able? There was a, a, a survey of all this, of the college presidents a couple, maybe it was about 15 years ago, and none of them thought, that, and the presidents actually technically run NCAA sports. They, when you're talking about schools voting, it's the presidents that vote. And it was something like 80-something percent said, we don't, we don't have faith that the presidents can fix NCAA sports. And that was a long time ago before they, the problems that they have now. Um, and I think that's because there's so many different constituents and, and all that. Um, what the old, yeah, I think there's no reason, and just for the record, we're not trying to destroy NCAA sports. We have no animosity to the NCAA itself. We have animosity to the injustice, for sure. But um, the conferences and schools, they can leave any time. And I think you're looking at the Big Ten and the SEC, kind of like the 800-pound gorillas in the space at this point. And I think they're going to have a lot to say. I think if they really wanted to leave the NCAA and start something different, I think they'd probably have the juice to do it. Now, it doesn't mean the NCAA would be, become immediately extinct. They can still govern a lot of other schools if the schools want them to, Division II, Division III. But the, the, the power um, that would be, I guess, siphoned away if the big schools left would be significant. Thank you. Do you think that um, maybe with NIL, it's a possibility that it's gone too far? Um, Talked about the NCAA and kind of their stance on amateurism, but um, with the transfer portal and NIL and people transferring all the time, it seems, do you think there's a possibility that it could go too far? Well, I think, you know, the, the one area that we're looking at that needs to be addressed uh, primarily is in certifying athlete agents and representation. You know, coupled with the NIL, every bill that we had, we also um, were able to free up players to secure representation. Prior to that, the NCAA banned players from having you know, NIL lawyers and agents and things like that represent them, which is an easy way to take advantage of an entire population, to prohibit them from having lawyers, right? Um, but some of the, there's been anecdotes of um, some bad actors in that space, you know, and there's even still bad actors in the other pro level spaces, you know, the agents, but the, they have the unions that can certify, like there's at least some accountability method, um, method to try to you know, punish, penalize, or ban bad actors. 
and you don't have that on the college level. You know, so for our, you know, for our purposes, we know that really that would probably take Congress, and that's one of the things we're advocating for. Um, states can do it state by state, but I don't know that they're going to spend the infrastructure to do something like that. The schools should have no part of it because they have a conflict of interest. Um, same with the conferences and the NCAA. I think that's the main area. But in terms of freedoms, you know, really there's two ways this goes. One, legislatively, there's a way to kind of design things. Um, or there's basically what you're kind of describing is the is free enterprise, right? America. America, so nobody here has, has restrictions in terms of transferring from ASU to another school, right? You have complete economic freedom. Another school might even offer you a scholarship. Another school, if you're a genius over here and they saw that the engineering student did something magnificent and they want him to go do, him or her go do grad school there or whatever, they can, they can poach, they can do whatever they want and people would celebrate that, right? Um, athletes are no different, right? I mean, there, there's, there's no real credible reason to say, college athletes shouldn't have those same freedoms. You know, and I will say that kind of wrapped in what Victoria mentioned before was that these schools aren't capping coaches salaries. They're not restricting coaches, they're not restricting coaches from going from one school to the next. Right? So like Lincoln Riley, he got poached from Oklahoma by USC. Nobody there was no uproar. I mean, probably in at Oklahoma there was people upset. It was not a matter of Congress. It wasn't a matter of, hey, we have to stop this, right? All the assistant coaches that leave, come in and come out, they leave with the playbook. They, they'll leave with Lincoln Riley's playbook, go to a rival with the same playbook. Nobody's, nobody's bothering to, to, to worry about that. You know? um, and, and so the other thing, when you look at the pro level, at least they revenue share, right? I just mentioned ASU, $107 million. Northern Arizona, $23 million. I think Ohio State's at $250 million. All right? They're not revenue sharing for competitive balance. Right? They're not doing that. No one's even trying. You know, if anything, Michigan, the Michigans and Ohio States and the Texas schools, they love the fact that they have the most money and they can do whatever they want. They have an advantage over Arizona State because they have t more than two times as much money as Arizona State. That's an advantage. They, they, they embrace that. They love that. But when it comes to the athletes, it's like, wait a minute. What if one school can afford to, you know, somehow arrange a better coach or there's a collective and there's a, a stronger magnet here or there? There's nothing morally wrong with that. Not in America, not in all of the other elements of college sports. And if you look, you know, there's an argument to say there's actually more parity now. It's almost like you have um, the talent was concentrated in just a handful of schools by and large. And now you're starting to see it disperse a little bit, you know? So when you're talking about competitive equity, and Andy Swartz predicted this, who's a, you know, one of the top economists on this whole thing, he said there's going to be, the talent will be more evenly distributed once you open up kind of the free market. So if it's about competitive equity, there really shouldn't be many restrictions, right? If it's about eliminating hypocrisy, there really shouldn't be any restrictions. If it's about, if it's about making sure there's no caps on compensation, like the coaches have, and Texas has, and there's nobody revenue sharing or anything, why come down on the athlete to pretend that competitive equity exists? So. That's our position. It wouldn't be evil for, a leg for some kind of legislation to come in and balance some of these things. Um, that's one alternative. Or the other is you strike down all of the illegal activity and you, let, and you enter the free market and you let the players benefit however they want. We have a question from Zoom. Two-parter, kind of related to what you were talking about. What do you think about proposals to privatize football and move football teams off campus where players play football first and have the option to go to school later? And related, if you could design a new college athletics model from scratch, what would it look like? All right. Um, well, the first one, you know, if you heard the question, and this has been something floated, I think, among academia for a couple of decades, at least since I started paying attention, was hey, let's get rid of football off of campuses. It's a distraction. It, you know, it's counter to our academic principles. It doesn't really fit. But for me, you know, what we look at is what are the great parts of college sports? You know, we talk a lot about the bad parts because we need to. The NCAA pats itself on its back all the time, okay? We don't need to really do much more, but there are good parts. And I think that, you know, from our perspective, it's a good thing that sports are actually on campus. And there's a way to do it. There's a way to do it that's better than what 
is being done now. Um, so, and I think it's fun for the for the you know the players to be involved and immersed. I think it's a it is a great educational opportunity, even though they need to be made better. Um, I think it's great for student life on campus. It's tremendous advertising, um, and I think if you move that off campus and you just license it out, you don't you don't get the same product, and I don't think you get the same eyeballs on the screens. Um, secondly, if I could start from scratch, I can't even. I'm trying to wrap my head around that. That's like a dream. Um, probably can't you know, dot the I's and cross the T's. But uh, one, there's enforced safety standards. Right now, if, if you don't know, Victoria mentioned it, there are still no safety standards that are enforced in college sports. So there's no concussion protocol. If you see a player stagger back into the game and throw up, which we've seen on television, the NCAA is not gonna investigate. To this day, to this day, you've seen the terrible, terrible headlines, headline after headline, sexual abuse, of athletes over decades and decades, hundreds and hundreds of athletes. Not an NCAA violation. They will not investigate, they will not punish anyone. And some of the people involved and complicit in that, they're still on college campuses. But if, that's, if that school were to pay a player one dime directly over and above the scholarship of what the NCAA says they can, the NCAA will come and investigate and punish everybody. who the player, okay? So that is way up there. I mean, that's a top priority. Jordan McNair, you know, we have real life examples, you know, um, almost 100 athletes have died prevented, prevented, preventable death since 2001. You know, and you mentioned Northwestern, that was Rashidi Willard, he died in uh, 2001. You know, to this day, no one, you know, there's, there's no rule against killing a player in a hazardous workout. There's nobody that's gonna investigate. So that is a pillar of something that needs to be changed. Fair revenue share, fair compensation, look at the pros. They get about 50% of team revenue, the players deserve 50%. Most of the players get 50% or more. But obviously in football, men and women's basketball, they don't. Um, so in terms of those two principles, medical expenses should be taken care of. Players need to have a real voice that's independent from the schools. You know, obviously that's why um, one reason why we're trying to give them the freedom to collectively bargain. Um, I don't know, I, I can't go into the smaller, we'll be here all day, but those are some of the principles of um, what a, uh, a model that's fair uh, for college athletes, what we've been advocating for. We have time for one more question. And then we can continue the conversation because there's food and beverages outside. So join us. Um, we'll walk across to the other side of this building into a courtyard area, stick around, grab some food and some drinks, and we'll continue these conversations. But for now, one last question. Uh, yeah, thank you for coming to talk to us. Uh, Patrick Carnahan, third year sports business. I wanted to ask, like, in what ways could you see pro sports leagues kind of maybe adopt a European model of training amateurs in the way that some soccer teams do in Europe? We've seen it some ways in like the NBA G League team with their Ignite and some MLB teams like training internationally. Could you see a world where amateur sports in the US is kind of revolutionized in that way? I think it needs to be, and I'll, I'll preface this. College sports is not amateur, but um, you know the youth, high school and youth sports, and I'm not an expert in this. Victoria knows a ton, Tom Ferry, he's the guy. Um, but many parents, if you're a parent in this room, and, you know, and actually you guys are young enough, I'm, I'm, I'm dated back, you know, the conference championships, those were the Pac-10 conference championships that my teams won a long time ago. But some of you may have gone through, um, you know, the AAU and travel ball and all that. That is not a system that really develops the talent of a nation. It is absolutely not. It's a system that, you know, capitalizes on dreams of parents and they, they take a lot of money from the parents. They take a lot of time from these families, not a ton of development. There's a lot of burnout, a lot of overuse injuries. It's a mess. You know, our nation isn't reaching its potential because of how, you know, that's all run. And, and there's a profit motive in that. You know, all the, all the um, travel ball profits that are going around, there's no incentive to counter value, you know, really no incentive to try to fix it. But there's, there's much better um, models in other nations where, you know, you have the principle that let's make sports available to everyone. Let's truly make it a wide pyramid where you don't have to have a bunch of money and you don't have to have fly from one state to the next and, you know, make it impossible for single parents to really have um, their kids in sports no matter your socioeconomic background, you know, bring sports to the masses 
and have assessments along the way where you can start to tease out at age appropriate times some of the talent, you know, and, and do something special with them, academies and things like that, different options. I think there's, I mean, there's a whole, hopefully you, there needs, Tom needs somebody, Victoria needs somebody, you know, we have an eye on it. We're trying to tackle um, college, college sports reform, but we do have an eye on future, our future college athletes. If they come in burnt out with a bunch of overuse injuries and mental health problems and tapped out from their sports, that's not a great quality. They're not going to have a great quality of experience on the college level, too. So that's a whole other area that needs to be improved, absolutely. And there's a 200-plus page report you can read from the Commission on the State of the U.S. Olympics and Paralympics that looks at the American sport, sports ecosystem kind of taking a step back and holistically. And you can find that at csusop.org. <laughs> because, yes, that can be the next conversation we have um, at sports at Humanities Institute is the future of the American sports ecosystem, prioritizing inclusivity and access and sport for all. So thank you for that. Um, let's give Ramogi Huma a round of applause. Thank you so much. This is for having me. This is great. And thank you all for being here. Thank you folks on Zoom. I'm so sorry you can't join us for the courtyard reception. It's gorgeous in Arizona today. So I apologize, but come to ASU soon and reach out to us and we'll get together and have some snacks in the nice weather too. So thank you all and let's move over to the courtyard and, and get something to eat. <laughs>